So let me start with the uh, first section of the session. And Radu, you have the floor. And I understand you will talk about the current treaty process in the Human Rights Council. Your time starts now, Radu. Thank you, Surya. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to cover uh, two aspects in my presentation. First, give a brief picture about what is happening in the UN Human Rights Council. What is the current situation regarding the draft treaty on uh, corporate accountability? And then I would like to comment and link to the uh, UN discussion, what is happening in the European Union, the current developments around due diligence legislation and how they might impact the UN process. So regarding the UN Human Rights Council, um, the question is what seems to be settled so far regarding the treaty and what are some of the debates on fundamental aspects regarding the purpose and the viability of the treaty. In terms of recent history of transnationals in the United Nations system, we have the 2003 draft norms on the responsibility of multinationals. They were not adopted. They were rejected by the commission. In 2011, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights were unanimously endorsed by states in the Human Rights Council. It's still a soft law document. And in 2014, the Human Rights Council created the mandate for an intergovernmental working group tasked with the, the mandate to negotiate, to, to draft, deliberate over a treaty on business and human rights. Um, in 2020, we are already at the third draft of the treaty, and my comments will be based on this latest draft treaty. What we see in this, uh, in this draft, um, we see a classic international human rights law treaty design. We have state obligations, and then there is a supervisory machinery in the UN consisting on an expert committee. So states will have obligations to regulate businesses and to report to the United Nations. It is unclear at this stage whether there will be an individual complaint procedure. What the treaty is about, of course, one can read the contents, uh, but one can also look at the purposes of the treaty. And when we read the, the latest draft, we see that um, one purpose is to reinforce human rights obligations of states in the context of business activities. There are aspects about prevention and remediation of abuses and access to justice for victims. That's the second purpose. And the third one is to advance international cooperation, mutual legal assistance among states when it comes to corporate issues. So these are the three main purposes. What has been settled so far, there will be a comprehensive treaty covering all human rights issues. This is often referred to as an overarching treaty on business and human rights. Um, there will not be a narrow treaty highlighting only some human rights issues or only some corporate responsibilities. So that design of a treaty was rejected. It's going to be a comprehensive treaty. What has also been rejected was a treaty that is directly binding on transnational corporations. It's not going to be that. Uh, there has been a rejection also of having a strong judicial or arbitral complaint mechanisms at the international level with jurisdiction over transnationals. That will not happen. And what was also rejected was the idea of a clear primacy of human rights law over economic law. So what we see is that the proponent states are very cautious that this treaty is not eroding state sovereignty as the foundational principle of the international legal order. It doesn't recognize transnationals as subjects of international law and does not create new and very strong international compliance mechanisms for companies. So some of the current debates, it's okay, it's going to be a comprehensive treaty, an overarching treaty, but what kind of treaty? A classic human rights law treaty with clear state obligations that states have to comply or, or some kind of a more general framework conventions like the tobacco convention. These are characterized by having a two-step approach. First, they outline general principles, state commit themselves to that, and only later on there will be specific uh, protocols, much more narrow, 
uh, dealing with specific issues. So some uh, uh, discussions uh, favor one or another of these uh, treaty designs. Uh, people proposing the framework convention um, are concerned that there is a fear that there is insufficient political support from major economies for a treaty. There is this specter of weak ratification and weak implementation, which they fear will backfire on the business and human rights agenda rather than advance it. So this debate is about what kind of treaty would most likely advance the business and human rights agenda. Uh, when it comes to the purposes behind the, the treaty, um, again, there is a lasting debate. Should the treaty be about a specific gap in international law, this gap being the transnational corporations that elude the jurisdiction of any single state and they are not covered by any international treaty? Or should the treaty be about the entire business sector, transnationals as well as domestic companies, and the treaty should be about creating due diligence obligations, turning the due diligence norms from the soft law, the guiding principles, into a treaty, into hard law. And there are pros and cons regarding uh, um, each of these uh, um, purposes, dealing with TNCs or with the entire business sector as well. Uh, there have been changes through the years in terms of uh, the treaty should uh, apply only to transnationals. That was the original Human Rights Council resolution. The latest drafts from 2019 on talk about all business enterprises. So this is a change of, uh, of focus that is quite controversial and it changes the treaty process dramatically because initially it was a sharp focus on parent companies and the home states as well as their failings. But now, arguably, there is a dual focus. It's both about home states and host states and their potential failings in regulating parent companies, but also suppliers. So this dual focus is not something that developing countries, proponent states welcome, and it's not the original design of the, of the treaty. In terms of uh, sanctions, of course, transnationals will be covered anyway. We see that uh, there is a looming battle regarding liability of parent companies. The draft treaty as it is now in Article 8 on liability, it's quite ambitious and it's trying to lift the corporate veil, it seems, and make the parent company accountable for what's happening in the uh, subsidiaries in supply chains. But there are also other ways of advancing corporate liability, perhaps less ambitious, that do not involve lifting the corporate fail. These are issues of facilitating access to justice for victims. One can change the burden of proof, add all kinds of presumptions, and affirm the principle of victim's choice regarding the applicable law and forum. These are all hotly debated. Finally, there are more modest approaches uh, mandatory due diligence backed by fines, uh, as well as judicial collaboration of states, issues of legal assistance. This could be also quite consequential. So there are more ambitious and more modest uh, ways of advancing corporate accountability. Moving now quickly to the um, EU, what are the likely impacts of current EU developments on the uh, UN process? I ask this question because as we know, we, uh, the European Union will adopt this due diligence legislation, possibly in the autumn or next year. My hypothesis is that this EU development will be uh, highly consequential for the UN process, for the content of the treaty, as well as for the ratification prospects. The EU has so far not participated in the intergovernmental working group in the UN, just observing. Um, I think that uh, the Commission now has on its table uh, three materials. It has a, a draft report from the European Parliament, a suggestion about the content of due diligence legislation. And then there is the French law from 2017, the duty of vigilance law, and the very recent German model, the Parliament has just passed the due diligence law last week. Uh, and what you see in all these three models is that the sanctioning regime is not so strong as in the UN. It's basically fines and injunctions. The civil liability rules are not changed. 
and the corporate veil is not being lifted. The parent company is still protected. So I think what we will see once the due diligence legislation will be adopted is that the commission might get more involved in the UN process and probably it will promote its own model, meaning mandatory human rights due diligence backed by this rather modest approach uh, to liability. So in conclusion, the UN approach is uh, more ambitious. It's also a nod to the past. It's trying to hold the parent companies accountable through lifting the corporate veil as well as uh, fines and other sanctions. Notably, there are also important counter hegemonic aims of developing countries. Uh, they have uh, grievances about the current international economic order. So that treaty in the UN might have symbolic functions as well as a crucial function of promoting solidarity among states in the global south. The EU uh, might lead soon globally with its, uh, uh, with its uh, intention to mandate uh, due diligence. I would say that once the EU has its own legislative design, it's going to be backed by EU member states, by businesses and civil society groups too, uh, then um, it will become much more active in UN deliberations. And I would say to conclude that this will shape the chances of adopting a UN treaty in dramatic ways, so perhaps not seen in the last uh, five decades since the UN has tried to regulate transnational corporations. It's going to be the first time that an uh, industrialized, major industrialized economy is promoting hard law uh, on transnationals rather than soft law approaches, guidance, and so on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Radu. And uh, now we also have the third uh, commentator joining us. So welcome, Guz. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, Guz uh, mm -hmm. is Senior Trade Advisor to the European External Action Service. So we'll get back to him in due course of time. But now I would like to invite Laura. And I understand, Laura, you will talk about the 2006 uh, Maritime Convention regime and its relevance to the decent uh, work agenda and the supply chains. So Laura, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Let me, because I have prepared a presentation, a brief presentation, let me share it with you. Before starting my presentation, I would like to thank Radu for putting in place this uh, wonderful session and the organizers of the LERA conference at Lund University, because it is fantastic. Yes, Julia, my, my topic is uh, to discuss the Maritime Level Convention because uh, it has been highlighted by the 2016 conference on this work on supply chains as a major achievement when it comes to, to uh, tackle uh, abuse infringements in the maritime logistics uh, supply chains. And for very good reasons, the Maritime Level Convention 2006 is a consolidated Maritime Level Convention, meaning that it consolidated around 70 ILO instruments that were developed by the International Labor Conference during its 100 years of existence, but with, with different uh, uh, success because many of them have not been ratified, many of them were already updated, so uh, something was needed to to, to advance labor rights uh, within the, the maritime logistics supply chains. And that's the reason why finally we have a convention that is uh, very comprehensive, addresses seafarers' rights in a very comprehensive manner through employment and social rights uh, through uh, four titles and around um, 80 pages <laughs> detailing different, uh, different employment and social rights of seafarers. The main purposes of the convention is, of course, to ensure the, uh, decent working and living conditions for all seafarers and to establish a system of fair competition among ship owners. And that was uh, the triggering uh, reason why uh, finally it was decided to move towards such a consolidated uh, convention. In 2006 and that led into force in 2013. In addition to compiling CFRS employment and social rights, uh, one main feature of this convention is that it has a very strong compliance and enforcement mechanisms. 
uh, even these, these mechanisms have different layers. Of course, we are talking of an international labor uh, organization convention, meaning that the supervisory mechanisms that uh, ILO itself have in place apply also to this convention, especially when it comes to the implementation state, meaning that every ratifying state has uh, reporting obligations towards ILO when it comes to the implementing process of the Marital Labor Convention. It's a very powerful tool because each state is monitored as to whether it is really embedded in its legislation and its law in, pra in practice, the Marital Labor Convention. Then Title V of this convention has uh, places responsibilities upon three categories of states. Of course, flat states, flat states are because of the public international law, the natural, so to say, responsible for labor, for social matters on board uh, ships. And uh, they do not only have um, inspection uh, obligations, but upon them there are also certification uh, obligations that have to be complied regularly, checking that the Maritime Labor Convention is actually being applied on board every ship, every ship that is covered by the Maritime Labor Convention. Of course, uh, taking into consideration that the flat state uh, principle is controversial and has many flaws, then the convention also places responsibilities upon uh, the port states. So port states have also a jurisdiction to inspect labor matters on board. This is a major achievement. And as you can well imagine, these uh, compliance and enforcement mechanism, mechanisms have been taken from the regulatory approach of the International Maritime Organization, creating a very, a very nice cooperation between the two international, between the two UN agencies. And then, last but not least, the Maritime Labor Convention created actually a new category of, of international states, so to, go, so to say, which is labor supplying countries because uh, of the employment agencies, because of the uh, intermediaries that are working in the field, uh, operating from labor supplying countries and, 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 and placing uh, seafarers for uh, to work for for foreign uh, ship owners. So also, we have reporting obligations or uh, responsibilities for these uh, states. And last but not the least, the Maritime Labor Convention does not forget about social dialogue and that does not forget about empowering the seafarers themselves and creates different complaint mechanisms. So the seafarers themselves, and, and that means also the representatives or any party with legitimate interest can file a complaint before flat state administration, port state administration, and also labor supplying administration. So we have different checks and balances to ensure the uh, enforcement of the Maritime Labor Convention. I have to warn that the Maritime Labor Convention does not address uh, litigation issues, meaning that uh, rules on jurisdiction and conflicts of law or laws are out of the question in, in this convention. The convention has been very, very successful in tackling ab abuses in these uh, uh, global supply chains. And nevertheless, I think it is time to take a look, sadly, a closer look at uh, its uh, achievement uh, from the perspective of the decent work agenda that you note is based on four pillars, employment, social protection, social dialogue, and rights at work, and then on a horizontal or transversal uh, basis, we need also to address gender equality and not discrimination. When it comes to employment, the, the labor conditions of uh, CFRS employment matters have uh, improved. But uh, nevertheless, there is a trend in the sector that is very worrying. There is a difference between the, the, the market for officers and the market for ratings. Officers are usually in, in, in shortage, so they get access to better labor conditions. However, that's not the case for ratings. Anyway, for all of them, there is a trend in the sector that is short-term employment. Most uh, people working on the sector do it on the basis of short-term employment. And that has a direct impact, impact on job insecurity. And job insecurity has also a direct impact 
on occupational safety and health uh, matters on board on board ships because the the seafarers tend not to engage in reporting what might go wrong on board the, the ship because of job insecurity. When it comes to social protection, the Maritime Labor Convention is, is innovative because it establishes different uh, mechanisms also uh, to ensure the some sort of social protection to, to seafarers. On one hand, ship owners uh, are obliged by flat states to take upon private insurance and, and that private insurance translated into three branches of social security, medical care, sickness benefits and employment injury uh, benefit that will be provided by ship owners. When it comes to social security, the, the convention makes also a breakthrough because deviates from the flat state and places the responsibility of providing access to social security to the country of residence of the of the seafarer. However, uh, the goal is just to provide uh, uh, at least th three branches. In practice, what is happening is that uh, there is confusion as to which country provides access to social security, to state social security. Many countries only provide the basic protection and usually via private insurance, meaning that they rely on ship owners to provide that minimum social protection. And uh, we have a shortage of international agreements on social security coordination, which are of the essence in, in this field. When it comes to social dialogue, the Convention makes uh, an, an impressive effort in trying to enhance uh, social dialogue, both uh, at the implementation process, also during the review process of the Convention itself, because the Convention can be regularly updated via a specific body that has created the Special Tripartite Committee. And then in the enforcement process, uh, it also places uh, the, the, the need to resort to social dialogue. However, social dialogue in this field faces very serious challenges because the Convention has in my opinion, two major flaws. The main flaw is that when addressing hours of work and hours of rest on board, the convention, the convention itself literally allows for seafarers to work on board uh, a maximum of 91 hours. That can be that can be uh, 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 that can be deviated when there is exceptional circumstances, meaning that they can be legally entitled to work up to 98 hours. And that's one issue that uh, on top of everything, when you go to the pra practice, uh, seafarers are not even, they are just working, not, not even paying attention up to the, the real number of hours they are, they are working. So there is a lot of underreporting uh, in the in the field. As as you can see, we have write a report at the WNU addressing this very serious issue. When it comes to discussing that provision, that standard in the Maritime Labor Convention, social dialogue is totally blocked. On the side of the employers, uh, the, there is a no go. And that is backed up by the states uh, that need to implement the Maritime Labor Convention. No one is talking about really addressing this uh, very serious issue at, uh, at work with a clear impact on occupational safety and health. And this year, we have minimum wages that um, uh, needed to be updated at the Joint Maritime Commission, and the social dialogue was also blocked. Despite the force of seafarers during this pandemic year, no way to, to, to go ahead. Uh, when it comes to rights uh, at work, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has also revealed a major systemic breach of the Maritime Labor Convention because uh, flat states, port states, and labor supplying countries have not complied with the rights in the Maritime Labor Convention, not ensuring uh, repatriation to, to seafarers during these pandemic uh, times. And that has also an impact on the supply chains because many charters now that um, the flow of goods has been restored, uh, in certain contracts are no crew exchange clause that uh, has led to UNTA to develop a, a diligence tool in order to try to tackle the matter. Wrapping up, 
the sector when it comes to gender equality discrimination the sector still has many issues that are not addressed by the convention we are talking of a male dominated sectors with multicultural crews and uh, uh, the provisions of the convention do not address in mandatory standard uh, these problems so I finish just to indicate that nevertheless the Marital Labor Convention is a major success in tackling some abuses in the in the sector, while in parallel we have the Working Fishing Convention that has only 80 ratifications and many, many reports of forced labor in that uh, supply chains that unfortunately are not being tackled in the same manner. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you also trying to keep within time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I hope uh, that some of the issues that you raise uh, would uh, be discussed in the discussion because the key issue is the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, in my view. So how, how does a, a strong convention like the one that you mentioned in terms of maritime convention regime uh, fails to deliver? In those difficult situations, I think, uh, and what lessons do we have for the decent supply? chain in this particular context. We'll come back to that. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we have the third and the final speaker, uh, Khalil. And Khalil will talk about uh, the previous process in the late 1970s to early 1990s for 20 years uh, that was attempted at the UN level, but in a different place. So Radu was talking about the dynamic of negotiation in Geneva. And Khalil, I understand, will talk about the dynamic of negotiation in New York, because they are part of the UN system, but different animals, I would say, based on my experience, how it operates in Geneva versus New York. So Khalil, uh, over to you, and we would really lo love to hear, uh, and then we can draw the contrast between the old process and the current process. Uh, you have the floor now, Khalil. Thank you, Surya. And, uh... Uh, although you know, the UN is spread all over the world, we are one organization. And uh, as uh, one organization, we have long sought a international regulatory framework uh, for the activities of transnational corporations. The code of conduct uh, on transnational corporations was an early effort. It uh, began in 1975 and it was pursued for 20 years. It did not succeed, uh, but the effort uh, paved the way uh, for uh, international guidelines and declarations in the OECD and the ILO in 1977 uh, and in the World Bank uh, in 1992. The private sector uh, launched its own industry guidelines, the International Chamber of Commerce, uh, in fact, uh, uh, preempted our code the day before by launching their own guidelines. So, so there is a, a, a positive effort there. In the UN, the General Assembly adopted a convention against corruption. And, uh, uh, and of course, as everyone knows, the Human Rights Council endorsed guiding principles on business and human rights uh, unanimously, and uh, it was a path-breaking event. The, eff uh, the effort continues, uh, and international activity evolves, and globalization is a new concern. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the UN uh, Code of Conduct, which is perhaps outdated now, it was not a failure. It is important to clarify three other misconceptions. First, the code of conduct and subsequent efforts are not anti-business. It is about maximizing the benefits and minimizing the harms of transnational activity. It is about ensuring that activities conform with international norms and adhere to domestic law. Second, the code of conduct was, only, was not only about corporate responsibility, it was also about the rights of transnational enterprises and also the obligations of their host and home countries. It was a balanced carrot and stick approach. Third, the code was to be an instrument 
of moral persuasion, not compulsory. If anything, it was more binding on countries than companies. This dispelled fears. Even Henry Kissinger was receptive to the code at one point. Sweden shared negotiations. I underline that because I heard that the, from Radu that the EU is, is still st sitting on the uh, sidelines uh, of, of the current effort. Uh, Sweden chaired the negotiations throughout for 20 years. And uh, uh, interestingly, there was quick and easy agreement on the responsibilities of companies. 90% of the code was agreed and only six issues were difficult. These six issues related to protections that investors should enjoy from their host countries. The negotiations dragged on for 20 years and the exercise was suspended after fatigue set in and developing countries discovered the benefits of foreign direct investment. Ironically, the, situ the situation today is reversed. Investor protections are now recognized and codified by most countries. However, when it comes to responsibilities, transnational corporations and their home countries are reluctant to formalize any review and reporting of the implementation. Some fear that acknowledging any responsibilities, even on a voluntary basis, might constitute soft law that could eventually be legally binding. So what was to be moral persuasion is now morality without persuasion. We need a reset. There are many lessons from the code exercise, but I would mention six. First, international response is preferable to unilateral actions. We are witnessing today a backlash with some developing countries wanting to revisit their bilateral treaties and unilaterally restore balance. Developed countries are also reverting to screening of investment and reshoring of supply chains. Such action would be a setback for the international investment framework. We need a collective response to redress common concerns. Second, countries should strive for the unanimity, legitimacy, and authority that the code negotiations enjoyed. There are many areas where government and business recognize investor responsibility. Human rights is one, but there's also fair trade, tax avoidance, sustainable development, climate change, ESG, or environmental, social, and corporate governance. The United Nations can place these concepts in international frameworks, thereby inducing companies and governments to act collectively. Third, we need to adopt a multi-stakeholder format enlisting broad segments of civil society, business, and government. The code negotiations engaged industry, trade unions, consumer groups, and academics. Civil society organizations can propel an intergovernmental exercise, and the underlying national parliamentary processes that determine country positions at the intergovernmental level. Shareholder activism can also prioritize corporate responsibility. The UN can give transnational voice to non-state actors, and they in turn can inject dynamism to UN forums. But it should be a multi-stakeholder involvement in order to avoid corporate capture or any other form of uh, capture. Fourth, we need to improve mechanisms. There is, for instance, awareness that the private dispute and arbitration mechanisms in international investment agreements are flawed. Angtar has proposed a roadmap for reform. 
an overall need is for the arbitration process to affirm the hierarchical superiority of human rights norms over investment treaties. Investor responsibilities should have equal status in the settlement of disputes as investor rights. We cannot have 50 shades of law. Fifth, conventions are not set in stone. Transnational activities are continuously evolving with globalization. Human rights were added to the OECD guidelines much later, only in 2011. Business relationships and supply chains are, were not explicitly foreseen in the code of conduct. It is important that protocols be dynamic instruments subject to review, appraisal, addition, and revision. This was a component of the draft code of conduct. Sixth and finally, the UN has authority to convene and to assist. The capacity building at the country level is all important. A treaty is insufficient. We have a treaty against corrupt practices, but yet these occur. There is need for capacity building, for transparent and accountable institutions, and for effective regulation at the country level. The UN Center and transnational corporations did all that in an impartial manner, respecting the needs and objectives of host countries. The UN needs to reestablish these technical assistance capabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khalil. That was excellent, especially your six lessons and uh, what implications do they have for the current treaty process? And hopefully there'll be time to discuss that and connect the dots with what Radu was saying earlier. All right, so that concludes the uh, first section of this session, uh, which had three kind of longish presentations, longish by my standard. Uh, now we'll move on to the second section, which will be rapid fire in the sense that there will be three commentators and they will have maximum two to three minutes to respond to a question that I'm going to pose to them. So David, if I may start with you first. David, your work uh, has focused on the relationship of uh, responsible business conduct and trade and investment agreements, right? So if you can explain to us briefly, what role do you see for those trade and investment agreements in promoting and encouraging responsible business conduct, including in the supply chains and covering both labor rights and human rights issues? David, you have the floor now. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, and thanks to the speakers for the excellent uh, presentation. I'm very pleased to, to join you today. Uh, I'll focus principally on investment treaties. Uh, investment protection treaties, as many of you know, are typically provide covered investors with protection from government actions such as discrimination or expropriation. A covered investor generally has access to an arbitral tribunal to seek remedies, and there are about 2,500 treaties in force today, mostly bilateral treaties. And today, as you know, um, sorry, there's considerable controversy over ISCS and investment treaties. One response has been to suggest more attention in treaties to business conduct, including in labor matters. Investment treaties have not traditionally sought to improve business conduct. Responsible business conduct, or RBC, is a major area of work for the OECD. The OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises are the broadest international standards on business conduct. They incorporate human rights standards aligned with the UNGPs and a labor chapter aligned with ILO standards. In efforts to encourage RBC and RBC, uh, including human rights due diligence by business, the OECD works intensively with governments, business, trade unions, and stakeholders, and we work closely with the UN and ILO. Recently, governments have requested work on business responsibilities and investment treaties. And in this work, we've noted that trade and investment agreements can affect business conduct in three different ways. First, their impact in limiting policy space for governments. Policy space may be the most important impact at present. 
and governments have taken action to protect policy space in their new uh, treaties. One recent trend here is to use state-to-state -state dispute settlement rather than investor-state dispute settlement for in, in recent treaties. And state-to-state -state dispute settlement generates fewer cases and fewer expansive interpretations by claimants and has less impact on policy space. Second, treaty provisions can strengthen domestic law or its enforcement, including on workplace issues. The ILO has done excellent work analyzing the increasing references <coughs> excuse me, to ILO standards and trade agreements. There's definitely growing interest. The trade and sustainable development chapters in EU agreements and United States, at least in the United States agreements, are examples in here. The third area is treaty provisions that speak directly to business. The idea here is that investment treaty protection is a valuable government supplied benefit. So it's been suggested that because treaty benefits are of interest to business, they can be used to encourage better business conduct. Treaties can state the government's encourage action, but there's also some interest in stronger approaches. Surya, you, you referred to due diligence by business to improve RBC, including human rights, and Radu noted important developments in the EU. It's increasingly recognized by governments, business, and others that it's vital for business to engage in such due diligence in order to reduce and remedy adverse effects. Questions have arisen about whether satisfactory due diligence should be a, quest, should be a condition for access to valuable investment protection benefits. This would heighten awareness of due diligence, including in new constituencies. There are challenges though. Uh, RBC due diligence is still an evolving field. Satisfaction is not generally seen as a yes, no question. There are concerns that litigation under investment treaties could become more complicated and expensive. Some have suggested reducing damages for investor claimants rather than barring access to ISDS where due diligence has been inadequate. In short, the investment treaty field is in ferment and its interaction with labor issues is a key area for debate. Interest from the academic community, international organizations and stakeholders in this area is certainly welcome. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. Uh, and that is an issue, in fact, on which I'm writing a report for the working group and I need to finish it in the next two weeks. So that's uh, so your comments are uh, directly relevant to that report as well. And I think if I could connect it with what Khalil was saying earlier, because the, the code of conduct in 1970s and 80s um, was focusing on both rights and responsibilities or obligations of these transnational corporations. But then there was this decoupling and decoupling meant that their rights became hard under investment agreements, which are mostly bilateral, but their responsibilities remained soft under the ILO declaration or the OECD guidelines. And now we are trying to fix this decoupling in this treaty process as an example of it. So, so I'll be happy to send uh, a chapter in which I explain this decoupling. Okay, but before we do that, uh, let me see if uh, Alison or Guz have any comments on what David mentioned or this broader question about the role of trade and investment agreements and the decent supply chain. Alison, I will start with you if you have any quick comment, and then I will come to Goose. Alison, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, yes, very I good. Um, what David points out is, is that we are in a process of addressing the deficits. And indeed, we need more teeth. If we ensure both in terms of mandatory due diligence, but also the link to ensure that really recommendations or even I would say model clauses are needed for countries to include in their future investment treaties. What we see is that investor protection um, has been of course the focus of the treaties we have thus far but what we do need to do is take into account not just workers rights and decent work but more broadly societal, societal concerns, because what we see in recent years, indeed in decades, is that we have um, 
a trend towards globalization delivering for the very few and not having the mechanisms for the redistributive benefits. And this is where both uh, from a perspective of investment treaties and the role of investment itself needs to be aligned with what we want from the mandatory due diligence framework. Thank you. Excellent. And I think that provides perhaps a good uh, connection to bring in uh, Guz here because the European Union initiatives, I think, are more broad rather than focusing only on decent supply because Green Deal is very ambitious, right? So, so any quick reflections from your side? Well, thank you, Surya. And, and sorry for linking up uh, rather late. Uh, I'm uh, become a lazy IT person where I expect the link to be sent to me and only have to click without a passport. Uh, so I had to relearn it the hard way. Now, ju just before, because I will address those issues later, uh, but one, one reaction to what David said, which I already indeed shared with you, we have, of course, the, the so-called trade and sustainable development chapters in our free trade agreements. Uh, uh, encompassing both a labor and environment component. And uh, we, we, we recently had even a panel with Korea on uh, their respect or their, I would say, limited respect to, to put it uh, diplomatically correct of the provisions uh, on the labor side. So we're, we're slowly learning that. It has been a strong push also by European Parliament, by national parliaments and civil society. So the Commission even decided to, to, to review its 15-point action plan on trade and sustainable development one year earlier. So they're, they're working hard to get that finalized even this year. So we may get to see, uh, I, I'm not directly saying more biting provisions, because of course they are legally binding the TSD chapters, but uh, ultimately uh, one will, will not withhold tariff preferences uh, in case of a, a non-respect, it's much more of a political process. And perhaps one generic comment, uh, but that's entirely a personal comment and not uh, 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 representing the views of the European Union. One could argue in terms of operational outcome and pressure and engagement that free trade agreements, but also our system of autonomous preferences, generalized system of preferences, GSP plus and everything but arms, are probably better suited to actually deal with pushing these issues than investment uh, treaties. They give you a, a, I would say, a more direct leverage. But again, that's an entirely personal comment. Thank you, Surya. Thank you very much, Guz. And uh, you, you made uh, several points, but I think the one point in which perhaps later on I would be interested is uh, you mentioned about the expert panel about South Korea. And in the recently concluded EU-China CHI, a similar process has been put in place. So I think I'll be curious, uh, based on the South Korean experience, uh, <laughs> what is the possibility of the success story of that uh, issue? Because supply chains are big in China, right? Uh, despite whatever else is happening in the last couple of years. So I'll be curious to get, get, get your thoughts on that uh, later, so you can think about it. So Alison, if I could uh, uh, bring back you again, and uh, what I would like to ask you here is that uh, enforcement of international instruments, whether UN instruments or ILO conventions, it is a big issue. And I think Laura highlighted it because of the COVID pandemic, even a very ambitious ILO convention has not been implemented in practice, right? So how do we improve the implementation on the ground in particular, because you represent ITUC, I'll be curious about the role of trade unions. If you ask my opinion, I think we have not paid enough attention to these players on the ground, bottom up. You look at the text of the OECD guidelines, look at the text of the UN guiding principles, there is not enough meat to bring in trade unions on the table in my view. Going forward, what do you think we should do differently? Because there's also a counter, counter argument that free market means uh, not robust trade unions because companies want free, 
freedom, right? And trade unions sometimes control that freedom of firing and firing. So how do you see this contradiction going forward uh, in terms of decent supply chain, Alisa? Over to you. Thank you. Well, I would love a long time to answer all those questions, but I know I have a short time. Um, and I would firstly start by saying that trade unions are both stubborn optimists and pragmatists. And so I would want to address uh, what we are speaking about in terms of social dialogue mechanisms and the importance of that. And really, Surya, what you say is so true. It's at a workplace level in terms of social dialogue with employers and governments at a national level, as well as within the framework that we've just discussed at a, at a multilateral level. So there's much more I would like to say about our agenda into the WTO, and I will come to that in a moment. But you asked me what makes sense for trade unions in this environment. And I would say even before the pandemic, we faced historic levels of inequality which you know, many institutions, including the OECD, have declared as a global risk. But this is a human risk. This is a human security risk, the risk of poverty, of inequality. Um, what we see in terms of the labor income share that has slumped over the last 30 to 40 years, despite massively increasing wealth globally. This has really been built, however, on dehumanizing exploitation in global supply chains. So what Lara was speaking of, Laura was speaking about rather in the maritime industry, you know, what we have seen with the pandemic with seafarers stranded in countries not being able to get home, not having access to medical support, nor fundamental social protection. So what we see is really a severely damaged trust in globalization. So what do we build here? What tools do we have? And how do we address that? And how do we assure that that is in line with the international commitments made under the UN Sustainable Development Goals and indeed the Paris Climate Agreement? So if we are to address these uneven distributional consequences, that's a very polite way of saying that trade has failed us globally and its impact on employment, on insecure jobs, on stagnating wages then what we have to address is the lack of political will to do so in the past. So we have these tools in our hands now. And we say that both at the level of enforcement of, trade, of the labor chapters in trade agreements, in free trade agreements, and at the WTO, where there is now a reform agenda in 2021, both in the lead up to the ministerial meeting later this year, but also in the informal talks going on between trade ministers now. If the pandemic has not emphasized in everybody's minds and a demand for action to address safety and security, the right to safe work, the right to decent work with minimum living wages, and a way to share fairly the productivity gains along global supply chains, indeed between workers and suppliers and multinationals who are at the top of the tree in this setting and have the most power in um, the global system, then labor rights and social clauses now need to be taken seriously. So we actually have, as a part of that reform agenda, um, a number of proposals that does include recognition of social dialogue. And I want to address the reality at the national level, at a workplace and national level, first and foremost, but within the framing of having a global setting. And that is that for the WTO reform to be serious, the inclusion of human and labor rights needs to be there. And we have a proposal that in the opening paragraph to the Marrakesh Agreement, and I can read that to you if we have time. But we also see that the establishment of a working group on labour issues, equivalent to that existing for environmental issues, is fundamental. Expanding Article 20E to include respect for all core ILO labour st standards and occupational health and safety revising Article 20 to include full employment, 
and a working party on labour issues once established could consider incorporating best practice regarding labour provisions and compliance measures in bilateral and regional free trade agreements into the WTO provisions. And finally, really to embed the practice of social dialogue within WTO structures. I hope that provides a framing for further discussion. Yes, thank you. Uh, of course, uh, my apologies because the questions are so broad and wide, you need half an hour to answer them adequately, but uh, thank you for providing these uh, very good reflections. And I think uh, Goose has already put some comments in the chat box uh, as, a, as a way of reacting to trade unions and, and, and what is the ideal goal we want to go and the practical difficulties. Because when we are negotiating with uh, about 200 states and other players and ILO is tripartite, that makes it more complicated. The reality is very different, right? So Goose, I don't know if you want to quickly add something uh, in addition to your chat comments, and then I will give the floor to David. Anything you want to add? Th 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 thank you, Surya. Well, perhaps to, to add based on, on part of my experience, with it, which is the GSP monitoring. And that means we, uh, until COVID, we met on a yearly or, or two yearly basis with all the major recipients, uh, some of them with very, very serious labor issues. Uh, it suffices to think of Pakistan, uh, the Philippines, uh, Sri Lanka, but also countries uh, such as uh, Armenia and, and, and uh, recently, of course, Uzbekistan, cotton harvest, uh, uh, child labor. Uh, well, uh, we, we, we meet with every, normally not only with the ILO, if they have a presence in our monitoring missions and before we meet with, uh, the, I would say, real trade unions and not so real trade unions. Uh, we meet with individual uh, trade. I liked, your, uh, I liked your term, captive trade union in the yeah, chat. Captive like trade. Yeah. Uh, 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 and also we, we're meeting with individual, I would say not only human rights defenders, but trade unionists, uh, even bar association lawyers. Uh, so there, uh, but what, what I found on the trade issues, as opposed to the I would say you, uh, major human, it's, it makes a sea change of engagement with the government if you're discussing the freedom of association, but at the same time can make the segue to civil and political rights. Whereas you start on civil and political rights, it's sometimes more difficult to engage with uh, the government. Uh, the moment one discusses labor issues, we have seen there is also a realization that this is really important also for the industry because we're not doing it we're coming in with with hard issues uh, well we, we may withdraw preferences if there's no progress on the labor issue so i i i saw that they sometimes were were door opening and and very important for our dialogue people forget that uh, we with, when we withdrew partially withdrew preferences on Cambodia eh, amongst a, a, a least developed country, nobody thought we would ever do that. But we, our initial initiation, including therefore our our, our assessment, as some people called it, an, an inquiry, was based not only I have to look at uh, on uh, the, the 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 international covenant on civil and political rights, but also on ILO conventions 87 and 98, that we gave them a comparative, let's say a relative, relatively clean bill of health. One can have, may, may have different opinions on that. Uh, uh, does not, at the end does not matter, uh, but because we, we raised the issue. Uh, but uh, we, we of course now see that even on the, the labor part, uh, unionists uh, being jailed or at least being accused and jailed, uh, uh, things uh, uh, deter have deteriorated also on the labor front. So for us, it's a very, very important component and, and one of the areas where we really have teeth both on the human rights, the traditional human rights, I would say, and the labor rights, which are of course are also considered Human rights, and we have a a I would say the last five to six years a sea change also in DG employment uh, commission service dealing with this issue where they're very actively taking 
these matters on board and 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 pushing it very hard. We 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 just sent or are in the process of sending our follow up questions, which we always do to all the GSP plus beneficiaries. And you'll be astonished. They're, not, they're never public because it's an engagement between the government and, and the country concerned. One would be astonished at the level of detail and also the harshness of the questions we're putting on the labor issue. So again, I've become more positive, perhaps a bit more positive than the other panelists on what we can achieve on, on the labor front. Excellent. And I think the concrete examples that you gave of Cambodia as a case study is really good. It provides uh, deep insights on what can change and what can perhaps not change, at least in the short term, right? What are the limitations of change, uh, yes. but how you can push the agenda as well. So that is very good. So David, uh, I, I know we're running out of time, but uh, I don't know if you would like to come in here and provide any quick reflections about your experience at the OECD in relation to the trade unions and the challenges and limitations that you see? Yes, thank you. I'm, I'm really enjoying the, the conversation with many, many inputs. And we see the importance of experience on the ground in trying to move this for, for trade unions, for governments, the complexities of the many constituencies that one runs into in, in other countries. Um, so uh, just, I guess, one, one element I, I would emphasize is the distinction between conditions and obligations. There's obvious, there's frequent references to uh, investor obligations in investment treaties as a possible angle, but there's a distinction between a condition and an obligation. A condition is a, something you must satisfy in order to obtain, in this case, a benefit. So there's no obligation, you can go without investor protection, but if you want it, you have to hit certain conditions. And so though some of the concerns about obligations, which are shared by uh, a number of OECD countries and putting them at the international level, and we heard from Radu that the, that the binding instrument has shifted to a more national regulation model there, uh, are not in play in the same way on conditionality. So that's an, one element. Another one I would just pick up on, Radu mentioned, you know, in this ongoing debate, Khalil as well, of the access to parent companies and, and the corporate veil. Investment treaties have been interpreted very widely to allow parent companies or shareholders more generally to, to look through the corporate veil for purposes of suing governments. So they are permitted to ignore the various corporate entities down to the operating company and sue for what are called reflective losses that they incur as a result of the injury to the operating company. And I think that interpretation, um, because it's not expressly addressed in the, in the treaty, is, is now in discussion at the OECD and at UNCTRAL. So I think for labor um, constituencies that what one might call or what courts call a cushy position for the parent company where it is able to look through the corporate veil offensively but still benefit from limited liability defensively. Domestic courts do not allow shareholders to benefit from that position. Investment treaties do. And so that's a debate that I think labor constituencies could engage in. Um, the third element, I think, for, for even on conditionality, but also more generally on investor obligations, this issue of due diligence, it's still early. How, yeah, I think, thinking needs to be put, how would adjudicators deal with this? Right? Take an investment treaty case. Let's say we had a condition on due diligence. We've got a case, NGOs come in and say, look, oh, this investor behaved badly. Is it general application across the corporate group of due diligence across its worldwide activities? Is that what you're looking at? General sort of compliance? That would be the OECD, RBC thrust, right? The general approach. Is it transaction specific? Is it just how well they did on the particular incident or, or, or investment that's, that's at stake? And one of the things about RBC that we try to encourage is for companies you know, to bring things out, to make things public, to address them, not to hide them. If you have a system that generates uh, disincentives for that kind of bringing things forward, 
you may be scoring an own goal. So I think we need to think very carefully about how, how this due diligence mechanism, I think the EU is certainly a leader in thinking about this, how it could be in, brought in in a way that would create you know, the positive incentives that we want to have. One approach, and I think the Dutch model a treaty have after a lot of internal discussions goes down this path is to do it at the damages or the remedies stage. And that's similar to US law on issues like bribery, where the company is liable if there's bribery, but then at the sanction stage in the criminal law process, the judge looks at the compliance mechanism of the company as a general matter for purposes of reducing. And so if the company has very strong anti-bribery policy, it will still be guilty, but it will be sanctioned much less than a company that doesn't. So okay. at the remedial stage may be an option. So I'll stop there. Uh, I know there's many, <laughs> many others. About, uh, thank you. Thank you points. very much. Uh, of course, again, several points, but I would like to pick one point that you highlight about reflective laws. And I would like to challenge Radu here a little bit. Unlike me, he keeps on defending this uh, co these corporate law principles of separate personality and limited liability. And I think, David, you have clearly highlighted this paradox that through this reflective loss idea, these investors cl claim significant compensation. They totally ignore the veil. But if the affected communities go after these parent companies, they bring in the veil. So how do we justify this kind of a situation? So Radu, that is for you to think, not to answer, but think about it. Uh, do you still uh, want to maintain this uh, selectivity and unjustified unfair position? But anyway, I'll come back to you. Uh, so Goose, uh, if I could come to you, uh, and by the way, uh, uh, the questions are welcome from the uh, participants as well. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box and I'm going to pick it from there uh, and pose to the either the speakers or the panelists. Uh, Goose, if uh, we could go back and talk about uh, a more holistic picture of the European Union. I mean, European Union is the hot, hot spot now at this point of time in terms of regulation. Regulation generally, whether it's climate change, conflict minerals, uh, forest timber, whatever, you name it, it is there. Corporate governance, wider reforms, Green Deal, mandatory human rights due diligence, whatnot. This is a very busy time. What do you see is realistic that is going to come out of this in terms of improving the conditions on the ground? Because let, let, me, let me highlight a red flag for you. My fear is that uh, these mandatory human rights due diligence may not bring a change on the ground. Rather, it may promote a tick box exercise and the workers in the global south, let us say where I'm sitting, they are not even part of the conversation on many occasions. So civil society organizations, members of European Parliament, European Commission, I have my doubts to what extent they are listening to the, these workers in the global south and what you are going to legislate and propose, how is it going to change this imbalance of power on the ground. And of course, your captive union point will also become relevant there. So again, uh, this is a very big question, Goose, but I, I hope if you can quickly reflect uh, on this and then we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you, Surya. Well, conditions on the ground, we don't know how mandatory due diligence or responsible business conduct actually does what it should be doing i would say in operating countries uh, you may have noticed that uh, or only what is it now uh, six seven weeks ago in the oecd forum on the minerals uh, the work was now really launched on monitoring and evaluating the impact and so we have so far little data of course their their export numbers uh, percentages of export covered by company due diligence schemes etc etc that is part of uh, uh, of the work but uh, uh, we haven't gotten to the bottom of the question are we just creating sometimes 
unrealistically high entry barriers for the operators on the ground because perspective is completely different if you're a miner or a creuseur in, in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. For you, the due diligence costs are important. Eh? For the ag average uh, producer of a mobile phone, it's 0, 0.00 something eh, of the cost, the, the cost of tin, for instance. So again, that work is, is only really starting. So in a way, we are still, as one of the scholars called it in a, in a recent discussion on the legally binding instrument, eh, eh, the EU is still in the experimentation phase. Of course, we're doing our best with impact assessment, etc., not to make any mistakes. Uh, but people forget that the responsible minerals regulation, by the way, I call it the responsible minerals regulation, because uh, at the end of the day, you want to be sourcing responsibly. And you don't want to be sourcing conflict related. Uh, uh, that is only an application. We're still in June, so it's in application for oh, less than six months. People tend to forget that. Uh, uh, and uh, the only other thing we have is the timber regulation. We have a lot uh, the timber scheme. Uh, we have a lot in the pipeline on sustainable corporate governance, uh, the Reinders Breton initiative. Uh, the, uh, uh, one should be also at the same time be careful that our green agenda will not be dominating too much the traditional human rights and labor rights uh, considerations. Yeah. So that is part of, uh, that is certainly are part of... Are they not connected? Of, but are they not connected? They are connected, they, they are connected, but be careful. In, even in the Reinders, I call it now the Reinders Breton initiative, there is, of course, the traditional, and, and David referred to a traditional due diligence, uh, which is a process-related obligation with, of course, depending how serious one's system is or how serious the disrespect is, uh, any liability will, will intervene. But for environment, uh, you've seen that from the from what Reinders said and, the, and, and what has been published so far, there is serious thinking about adding a result or performance-based requirement. Uh, and so uh, for the environmental part of the due diligence, we're going one step further. And if you combine that then with, I would say, the director's responsibility with a taxonomy, with a corporate sustainability reporting, we but can if I go could, if I could jump in though. Sorry? If I could step in here, I think you're absolutely right. And I think uh, at least I have started arguing for some time now that we need to focus more on the outcomes. So it is excellent that European Union is moving towards outcomes. But then my question is, if you go towards outcomes in the environmental regime or in the climate change, you set the targets that you need to achieve ABC by this date, you are focusing on the outcomes. Will that not have an impact on human rights as well? Because European Union will be pushed to do the same approach in human rights because you are the leader on human rights. Indeed. Indeed, but uh, uh, at least on the environmental part, and I, I, I used to be the negotiator for the EU of the Kyoto Protocol, so I have some scars on my back still. Um, it, it might, I'm saying it might be easier to set these targets. Uh, the nature of the uh, human rights and labor rights conventions lend themselves to this approach much more, dif much more difficultly. Uh, and we're seeing that in our GSP monitoring, where, of course, there are concerns, serious concerns, on virtually all countries in the system. But the whole purpose is to push them towards better implementation. That's the whole, the whole scheme. So I, I would say uh, I, I can't give you a real, uh, a real uh, 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 explanation. Uh, I, I'm sorry for that, or a convincing argument. But coming back to rapidly to what Radu said, and I'm looking at what I what I wanted also to to raise on the legally binding instrument, I would say don't expect too much drama for the next negotiating session. We still have to see on what kind what what kind of text our Ecuadorian friends come up with. I think they scheduled that for early uh, August. 
And in terms of the EU engagement, I had the pleasure or rather the discomfort of representing the EU at the two previous negotiating sessions. And it's a bit like, okay, you, you partially engage, which is as difficult as being partially pregnant, I think, uh, <laughs> EU. Uh, I like your analogies. Yeah, so, so but I would say more engagement uh, also requires more clarity internally on the EU acquis. With the Reinders Breton proposal only out there, I would say towards later this year, I'll be very prudent. Uh, we will only have clarity where the EU is actually moving on due diligence, uh, any liability, uh, and, and any related, I would say, director's obligations. Clarity on that is only when Parliament and Council put their signature on the dotted lines. Uh, after a conciliation procedure, which we all know may take at least two years. So uh, again, we need, or we can see different ways of engaging and better engaging and more on substance. I don't rule that out, but we also need to take into account the cross-regional buy-in. We know that India and China participate. But the, in, in reality, they don't participate because you see they're, they're putting a few, I think, uh, 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 roadblocks in, in the process. So uh, we need all the major economies in. We need, the, um, we need America, we need Japan, we need the EU, but we also need the Indias, the Chinas, and uh, I would say uh, the Brazils uh, of this world. Uh, that, that, that's as far as I can go on, on, on the legally binding that's, instrument. That's on, very useful. On, yeah, on the business position, I always hear this, this, this thing about the, okay, also our colleague from UNCTED, a bit critical, why, isn't, uh, why, why are we not engaging? I see business, my experience now with the minerals work of the OECD, which I have the pleasure also of co-chairing, uh, is that industry is engaged. Perhaps they feel more comfortable at the OECD uh, than in UNCTAD, uh, and, and I've been uh, the UN representative in Geneva, so I, I know this sentiment, wrong or right, but even uh, the OECD is, I think, rapidly moving towards becoming much more active on responsible business conduct, and, I, I, and with countries such as the 38th member, Costa Rica, which is not a major industrialized country, uh, you, you, you're seeing a different... Uh, uh, perspective. One thing on the cost of due diligence, which I think is important to note, uh, we, we had nightmare scenarios presented when we came up with the minerals regulation industry, especially the electronics industry, the federations. By the way, federations are some mostly more conservative than individual companies. In individual companies, you will find very many front runners. Eh? Yeah, but, some okay, leaders, this is, some leaders, yeah. Yeah, that's the nature of things. But all these nightmare scenarios, I still remember, and sorry for putting a Boeing on the spot, discussions with uh, 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 with Ben Cohen from Boeing, and uh, who, who depicted these nightmare scenarios of thousands and thousands of minis of, of products and supply chains, which is now part of the process. Everybody has gotten to grips with this. And I still remember the, the CEO of Umicore, not in all areas a great company. They have their they have their environment issues in Belgium, but on indeed on due diligence, they're doing a, the right thing. And I once asked him a question in a seminar. Uh, can you give us during that discussion? Can you give us an estimate of the cost of the of the cost of due diligence for your company? And he basically said, Mr. Houghton, completely wrong question. And I, I can be wrong very, very many times. He said, it's not about the cost of due diligence. It's the cost of not doing due diligence. I think I'll end at, at that point. So again, I'm a, I'm a glass half full person. And I've seen, I've asked it, I was asked this question in Parliament about, I'd say, when we, when we negotiated with Parliament, the minerals regulation. It, well, we have we had very little evidence. Again, we were experimenting also in that time. We only had one Dutch report, SOMO, saying there is only an X percentage of companies doing due diligence based on what they say, what they have on their website or corporate reporting. Uh, and uh, well, a limit, whether it was 8 or 10%, I don't remember. And I... 
I said to Parliament, don't put don't put a number in in five years on whether it should now be twenty percent. I'll be I'll be already very happy with doubling. I think we we've achieved that uh, by far. I would say so. Again, much more positive. What comes out, all still officially under impact assessment, Reinders uh, Breton, uh, but uh, interesting times ahead. And I think there is no doubt. And coming back to the labor issue, that labor rights are part of human rights. And uh, uh, it suffices to look at the cases uh, before the contact points of multinationals. Very many of those, of course, have a labor component that they don't always lead to the result which the, which the applicants aim for, at least on that part, the non -judicial, important non-judicial grievance mechanism, you see, the, you see the labor impact. Sorry for this sales pitch. No, no, that, that's fine. Uh, I think a uh, lot of uh, useful insights, uh, which sometimes we don't get uh, from a person like you, <laughs> because uh, you have to be careful what you say yeah. and what you don't say. So very, very appreciated. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to unpack uh, some of these issues. Uh, we just have four minutes left. So what I propose is I would like to go back to the uh, original three speakers and uh, give them the floor to say the last few words or any reflections that you may have uh, based on what you heard. So Radu, if I may start, probably I will finish with Radu. So why don't I start with uh, Laura? Laura, Khalil, and Radu. I will follow this order. So Laura, if you don't mind uh, any reflections on your side uh, or any final words, any one or two suggestions that you have where we should be going in terms of uh, decent work agenda going forward? Well, there are so many, uh, so many ideas around. I congratulate uh, the panelists and of course my, my co-speakers for, for wonderful presentations. One takeaway is that, uh, yes, I totally agree that with the, the chapters discussing the, um, the, the correlation between trade and uh, labor are essential and uh, much more emphasis has to be put on ILO standards because when we talk about ILO standards, it's just the core labor standards and they are totally insufficient. So for one good example is the, is the Working Fishing Convention that is not sufficiently ratified and it should be present in any fishing treaty agreement that the European Union is putting in place. And I am talking about real labor rights and not just the core labor rights because the, 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 the 1998 declaration is, is very minimal, as we know. Very important, the correlation between these treaties and the role of the ILO, but nevertheless, we have to, to touch both. And that would be my, my takeaway. That's a very good practical suggestion that go beyond the core. So let us have more ambitious goal in mind. So very good. And Alison is already giving you a thumbs up. So, so she doesn't need to speak. She, you spoke for her as well, I believe. Uh, Khalil, uh, if you have uh, one minute, what is your message based on your rich past experience and what you are hearing from those in terms of the current negotiating process? Any final uh, words from uh, you? Uh, we had a very stimulating discussion and I will make four points, very quick points. Uh, first, on, uh, uh, on dispute uh, uh, settlement. Of course, we, uh, we need to improve that, but we also need a progress on uh, dispute prevention. And, and this is an area where OECD has done some work and there's a, also pioneering work by Korea on ombudsman and other mechanisms. And in the World Trade Organization, we uh, are uh, cooperating on investment facilitation, which can, uh, uh, help uh, uh, prevent disputes before they actually come to the question of, uh, of uh, settlement. Second quick point is on the, uh, the, uh, the, what was it, the due diligence uh, mechanism. Uh, due diligence is the counterpart of screening. If you have better due diligence, there's less need for the host country to screen the investment. Therefore, you need standards, uh, agreed standards, international standards on, on what constitutes a, a good investment. 
uh, a sustainable investment and one that respects everyone. And secondly, the process must be transparent. And third, it must engage all the stakeholders. Uh, yeah. uh, Nestle, for example, has talked about value creation. And to yeah. the extent that you have agreement on how the investment creates value for everyone, then due diligence is contributing uh, to the enrichment of the process. Maybe one last point, because we, we are all, we have finished the time. Third point. Third point is on labor, uh, the, okay. the race to the bottom. And if, if, if we have an agreement on currency manipulation. Why not an agreement on wage suppression? You know, why do companies go and look, look for the cheapest wage uh, uh, location? Uh, uh, why can't we have agreement on that? And the fourth point on what Gus was talking about uh, on the various uh, bilateral, uh, uh, the regional agreements on uh, uh, everything but arms and the like, these are intended to help developing countries and least developed countries to diversify. So it's not good to just uh, impose conditionalities. You must also have technical assistance to help them improve their frameworks. So with that uh, comes uh, better policies and and. Uh, and, and thank, thank you very much, Khalil. A uh, uh, lot of food for thought there. Uh, Radu, my friend, sorry, uh, the time is not on our side, but uh, whatever you want to say to wrap it up. Thank you. Well, I will say my thank to you and to the participants so much. Good information and insights. That has been absolutely brilliant. Uh, to conclude, I would say regarding your point, uh, Surya, I'm defending the corporate veil, you say. Uh, I would say, let's account for it correctly and uh, see the facts and uh, treat it perhaps not as a legal technicality that can be put aside easily, but a rather foundational principle, whether we like it or not. And then the question is how we deal with it. And I think there are different ways to deal with it. Some were actually touched uh, by different speakers now. And I think for the UN, it's exciting times because they can innovate with this treaty. Uh, the things have changed, the context have changed, uh, lots of good uh, um, legislation and policies coming from different regions and countries. Let's see how the UN can distill uh, and advance these uh, gains that we have made in the last 20 years. All right, so thank you very much, Rado. And with that, uh, I would also like to add my thanks, uh, first of all, to Rado himself uh, for pulling us together and putting this session together, bringing us together in this virtual format, not an easy task. Uh, so thank you very much, Radu. And I would also like to thank the technical team uh, facilitating all the uh, support without which we could not have done this. And of course, all the speakers and the commentators and of course, some participants as well. So it was a wonderful experience for me too. I wish we had more time, but time is never enough. Uh, let us hope to continue this conversation going forward. Bye for now.